All right, everybody, this is probably the chapter of They Raced Horses on Main Street by Anthony H. Coppola that you have been waiting for. Part four in the book. We're actually up to part seven on the videos slash uh, recordings or however you're doing this. Um, and we are reading today about constables and the deputy sheriff. From the 1860s and on, the arrests, trials, and morals of Douglas received a great deal of unfavorable attention, not only from the better class of citizens from the community, but also from the newspapers, both local and out of town. Drunkenness, burglary, loitering, larceny, assault and battery, violations of liquor laws, tramps, and disturbing the Sabbath peace were mostly responsible for this state of affairs. Almost every day a tramp, and at times several of them, came into the town and loitered on the main street where the shops, stores, and post office were located. There they occasionally disturbed the passerbys and the shoppers, and in general presented a ragged and unsightly appearance. The constables did their best to run the tramps out of town, but were unable to cope with the constant influx. The tramps, who were not caught and hustled out by the law, found a night's lodging by breaking into barns, outbuildings, and other inviting places. Not surprisingly, the townsfolk were angered and ashamed at having the neat and tranquil main street soiled by the presence of tramps, hobos, and, you guessed it, vagabonds. So it naturally followed that the folk demanded that selectmen put an end to the disgraceful condition. The selectmen expressed their concern, agreed with the people in their grievances, and then proceeded to overlook the whole matter. In addition to the tramps, the constables were summoned to investigate other acts of law-breaking and attempt to apprehend the culprits. When arrests were made, the constables had to immediately hire a rig and take the arrested persons to Sutton, Whitensville, or Uxbridge, where they were held overnight to await court appearance. The constant tramp problem, other unlawful acts, and transportation to neighboring towns taxed the time and patiences of the deputy sheriff and his constables because Douglas had no safe place for immediate confinement. The citizens, the merchants, and in particular the constables, set <clears throat> set up an uproar to correct this intolerable situation by persuading the selectmen to place an article on the town warrant for the construction of a lockup. The voters acted upon the article in this manner. At the annual town meeting of 1868, the 11th article in relation to a lockup in East Douglas was warmly contested, and a lively debate was kept up for some time between John Abbott, S.W. Heath, C. Emmons, Stillman Russell, W.E. Jones, and others. The vote was finally reached, and by a division of the House, it was decided yea 45 to 41. A motion was made by A.F. Brown that the selectmen be instructed to furnish said lockup, which was defeated, 48 to 46. Mr. Brown then moved that the constable be instructed to provide a suitable lockup, which motion was also defeated. The citizens thought that a lockup would be fine for the town, and so voted. However, their thoughts did not extend far enough to appropriate the money to actually build one. This lack of action by the voters angered one of the town's citizens, who immediately expressed his feelings in this letter to the Douglas Herald newspaper. Mr. Editor, at our town meeting on Tuesday last, one of the principal speakers in advocating the necessity of a lockup in East Douglas stated that Blackstone and other places with no newspaper could and did support one, and thought it strange that Douglas could support a newspaper and not a place for the confinement of persons under arrest. At a recent town meeting in Blackstone, it was voted to license the sale of intoxicating liquors, the vote standing 147 to 14, while Douglas decided by a majority of 36 to not grant licenses. Which of the two institutions does the gentleman prefer, a newspaper with no license, or a lockup and free rum? <clears throat> lockup or not, the tramps still came, the laws were still broken, and the arrests, arraignments, and trials continued. The following are but a fraction of the incidents which occurred. Douglas, Police Court Records, 1868. September 16th, before Justice Heath, Francis Larned was arraigned for larceny of apples, fined $5 and costs. September 28th, before Justice S.A. Taft of Uxbridge, A. Morton of Douglas for assault and battery was fined $1 and costs. September 19th, before E.J. Mills of Sutton, Stephen J. Payne of Douglas for assault and battery was fined $3 and costs. December 14th, before Justice Heath, G.O. A. Packard for assault and battery, pled guilty, fined $2 and costs. George A. Packard, common drunkard, pled guilty, fined costs, and recognized to keep the peace six months, weren't placed on file. December 16th, Leander Andrews, 
Common drunkard, pled not guilty, fined five dollars in costs. Frank Lambert, common drunkard, pled not guilty, 30 days in the House of Correction. December 17th, Lauren Prince, common drunkard, pled not guilty, 60 days in House of Correction. <clears throat> Turn the page. At a recent term of the Supreme Court in Worcester, eight divorces were granted, and three of them were to parties in this town. A burglary was committed at the house of Mr. Charles L. Goodwin on Wednesday night. The rascal entered by a window at around 11 o'clock, and going into the bedroom occupied by Mr. Goodwin, took his clothing from a chair near the foot of the bed and carried it to an adjoining shop and rifled the pockets of a wallet containing $47.70 and a note of $50, United States licenses and other documents. Mr. G. was disturbed in the night by a noise in the direction of the shop and arose to make an investigation, but discovering nothing to excite suspicion, he again retired. In the morning, his clothing was found hanging in the shop window and the contents of the pockets gone. Appearances indicate that the burglary was committed by a woman or some person wearing a number four woman's shoes. A warrant was issued against one John Donnelly from Rhode Island, who was in company with John Carpenter of Sutton at the East Douglas Hotel. The warrant was put into the hands of Constable Balcom, who proceeded immediately to arrest Donnelly, who was at the hotel. Just as the constable put his hand upon Donnelly, Carpenter started his horse. For a moment, the excitement was intense, a sort of hurdle race. Carpenter, Donnelly, constable, and horses, in their flight, they came very near running over a lady who was walking down the street at the time. With the assistance of Carpenter, Donnelly proved too fleet for the constable and fleft in the direction of Rhode Island with colors flying. Moral. Handle your tools without mittens. A cat in gloves catches no mice. A quantity of squashes and corn was missing from George Manahan's field on Monday, supposed to have been stolen the night previous. Wagon tracks indicate um, which way the property had been carried and on being followed up led to the barn of Frederick Wallace where what was supposed to be a portion of the corn was found concealed under the hay. The wagon was also traced to Thomas Flynn's barn. Armed with a warrant for the arrest of Wallace, who is an old offender, Constable Balcom repaired to the spot on Monday afternoon and arrested the said Wallace. He was taken before trial, Justice Mills of Sutton, on Tuesday, and pleaded not guilty. The search of Flynn's premises elicited nothing to lead to his arrest. The Notorious Jack Humphrey and Catherine McGuire alias Irish Kate, of doubtful reputation, entertained the people on Main Street in a manner calculated to shock all who have any conception of decency. To say the least, the affair was a disgrace to the village. They can only be wiped out by a summary arrest and punishment for all who participate in such occurrences hereafter. Why it was not done in this case, we cannot account for. These incidents, and many others, prompted the editor of the Worcester Gazette to write that the state of society had not improved much in Douglas lately, considering the number of arrests and trials in the few months, in the past few months. <clears throat> the Big Robbery Among the various incidents connected with the history of the town, none caused more excitement than the discovery of the daring burglary of the Douglas Axe Company safe during the early morning hours of May 15, 1869. The company's heavy iron safe was located in a rear room of the office. The outer door of the safe was opened easily, but the inside door completely baffled the burglars, even though they cut the hinges off the door. They had to abandon their efforts at that point and turn their attention to the top of the safe, where they drove iron wedges into an angle formed uh, by the juncture of the front and upper plates of the inside of the compartment. They succeeded, and with an iron hook, fished out the drawers everything of value. The robbery had to be the work of thoroughly experienced burglars. After closely examining the matter, an experienced safe manufacturer pronounced the job skillfully done. The startling fact was discovered around 7 o'clock on the morning of May 15th when the clerk opened the door of the office to find a shocking scene. Scattered about the floor in every direction were Jimmy's old colt chisels, wedges, hammers, hooks, etc., which completed the picture of violence and ruin. At that time, the Douglas Axe Company required $25,000 monthly for the wages of the men. Fortunately for the company, the money had been forwarded somewhat later than usual, so no doubt to the great disappointment of the thieves. Experienced detectives came from Boston, Providence, and other points, including the chief of police of Boston, to investigate, examine, and search for the perpetrators. 
a detective from Providence took a description of a couple of suspicious-looking persons who had been seen lurking about the town earlier in the week. It was learned that the detectives hired a team and driver from the livery stable, went to Worcester, and stopped at the Bay State House until morning, then boarded the 8 o'clock train to Boston. The Worcester Gazette said the names they wrote on the hotel register were fictitious. Several persons, one from New York, were arrested and brought to East Douglas on suspicion of being implicated in the robbery, but were discharged for lack of evidence. Many townspeople lost money, securities, and valuables, which amounted to $25,000. The Axe Company's safe was used as a deposit place, being the only safe place in the village. The thieves were never apprehended. The Stone Hotel In 1876, eight years after the negative vote for a lockup, the voters finally appropriated funds to erect one, which was a small stone building off Main Street just before the Whiting Tavern. The deputy sheriff and his constables now had a secure place to swiftly lodge persons arrested for violations of the law. This lifted the burden from the constables of taking the lawbreakers to an out-of-town place of security. The lockup solved the problem of where to confine persons arrested for burglary, larceny, or disturbing the peace. However, it gained two other problems, the drunks and the tramps who occupied the lockup most of the year. The sight of Deputy Sheriff Edwin P. Heath leading a drunk to the lockup caused groups of curious boys to follow the hapless individual to the stone building. Constable Charles C. Labrie used to round up drunken persons and hustle them off to the lockup, especially on Saturday nights when large groups gathered on Main Street, many of whom drank too much. The tramps, who used to be run out of town before the lockup was built, instead received excellent treatment from the town, which showed compassion by giving a place to rest for the poor individuals. They were given food, water, a cot and blanket, and decent night's lodging and breakfast. The lockup became a stopover for the tramps, who partook of the fine accommodations of the new building. It must have been a popular place because one night alone, eleven tramps were lodged there. Mr. E. H. Lever, keeper of the lockup, always kept the inside thoroughly cleansed and whitewashed before, for he was bound to give the poor tramps comfortable quarters. This special and generous treatment provided for the tramps drew derision from the townspeople, who referred to it as the Stone Hotel. Expense of lodging tramps for a year. The Town Report of 1880. Lockup account. Paid for A. F. Jones. Wood for lockup. 475. Paid for George Abbott. Crackers. 623. Paid for John Drapo, care of 74 tramps. 925. Paid for William Reed, care of 285 tramps. 3620. Miscellaneous expense, M.M. M. Luther issuing tickets to tramps. $2. Miscellaneous expense and supplies, 1098. Tramps lodged and fed at lockup during the year, $359. Average cost each, about 16 cents. Criminals committed during the year, Seven. The lockup was not restricted for men only, for a news item of 1884 reported that three female tramps received overnight lodging in the Stone Hotel, and another item of the same year stated the poor forlorn tramps never taxed our hospitality twice, at least under the same name. One night, two tramps named George Thompson and Edward Crandall, Crandall obviously quite independent and able, broke in two windows of the schoolhouse in the village, went in and spent the night in a warm coal stove, or by a warm coal stove. On the following morning, around 7 o'clock, the janitor, Frank Snow, found them in the house when he went to attend the fires. The tramps quickly departed and headed for the railroad station, while in the meantime, Mr. Snow rushed to get Constable Stillman, who pursued and arrested the pair and then took them by railroad to Blackstone for arraignment. Back in 1868, the Worcester Gazette stated that the morals of Douglas had not improved much. Eighteen years later, in 1886, there seems to be no change in that respect, according to these two observations. There is quite frequent complaint about the morals of our pleasant village are not what they should be. Now, we much dislike to believe that this is the case, although in certain times, respects, it is apparent that there is much room for improvement. Doubtless the liquor traffic, which to our shame must be acknowledged is in a flourishing state despite prohibition, is a powerful motor to lower the morals of the community. There are also frequent violations of the Sabbath, especially by those who imbibe too freely at the fountain of misery, and their ribald songs and staggering presence frequently mar the peace and quiet of our boasted New England Sabbath. In other respects, which we will not mention, there certainly is cause for remonstrance, and yet possibly not more so than other communities. The whole difficulty, as far as we can judge, is the laxity with which the laws are enforced. 
here, a responsibility that lies with our influential and respected citizens upon whom rests the stigma, if there be such, of the town's depressed moral state. Let some of our citizens who respect virtue and morality arouse themselves and put the law in force, either enter complaints, uh, which our officers are obliged to take notice of, and we shall soon perceive a healthier moral tone in a community, which we have so high a regard for as the place in which are situated is situated our homes and firesides. It is questionable whether our quiet village deserves the reputation which some people are determined it shall bear in regard to its moral stamina. Our inhabitants are human beings, which entails upon them human frailties, but as far as we have been able to discover, just like other mortals in other communities, it is not a lawless town we live in, nor yet a model one. We have good and bad among us, just like other places, no worse or no better. Those who wish to lower its standing by bringing into prominence the evils that always exist in every human society, no matter where, and uncharitably withhold the good, which, if at the same time was put into comparison, would, be, would in great measure overshadow and show how few evils really are, would exert themselves to blot them out and raise the standard of morality instead of heralding those weaknesses to the outside world, they would soon find the morals of the town in a far healthier state. We have prohibition, good churches, excellent organizations for the elevation of society, and other attributes to make up a respectable and law-abiding community, and to be forever finding fault and grumbling because there is not perfection is a poor way to obtain a better state of things. Better bring to light what is good there is among us, that by its resplendency it may obscure the evil that always attaches itself to all human society. <clears throat> Deputy Sheriff Edwin P. Heath and six constables enforced the law as best they could, considering they were on call to handle the many violations which occurred. Sheriff Heath had a store in the rear of his house. Stillman Russell ran the drug store, and Constables Charles C. Labrie and Herbert Hughes were employees of the Douglas Axe Company. The other constables, Willie Manahan, John Howard, and Francis J. Young, worked at various locations in the town. The sheriff's most effective constable was C. C. Labrie, the only constable in Douglas who wore a blue suit with brass buttons. Constable Labrie was a large and powerful man who tipped the scales at about 250 pounds. 1900 to 1908. The big crowd which frequented the East Douglas Hotel Saturday night was extremely quiet. Only three persons were arrested. Eugene E. Smith, alias Fred P. Smith of Douglas, was indicted by the grand jury at Fitchburg Wednesday on the charge of breaking and entering a freight car on the New York, New Hampshire, and Hartford Railroad at East Douglas. He was tried the same day and sentenced to two years at hard labor in the penitentiary. A law has been put in force here which compels all children under 17 years of age to be off the village streets after 9 o'clock every night. The mill and also the church bells ring at that hour, and the selectmen have given strict orders to all of the town officers to see that the law is enforced. Up to the present, nothing has been found out about the robbery and holdup in the Douglas Woods. James Livingston, a peddler, was held up and robbed of $112 by two masked men. One of the Douglas constables made an investigation and could find no trace of the man or the robbers. Three slot machines, which have been doing a big business this summer in East Douglas, have disappeared from their positions, per the order of Deputy Edwin P. Heath. Some person or persons whose inclination is certainly up to date in one way, that of getting something for nothing, tried the game sometime between sunset Friday night and sunrise Saturday morning and succeeded fairly well. The People's Store, J.W. Irving, proprietor, was entered by prying up a window by some thief and the place generally ransacked. Articles consisting of gents' furnishings, such as collars, ties, and mufflers, were found to be missing. The thieves also had an eye for the jewelry case, from which gold-plated watch chains, finger rings, and various articles of sterling silverware were extracted. In all the goods taken valued at a number of dollars and were selected with great care. It may have been the work of some light-fingered gentry, or some of the numerous hobos that daily visit our town, but as no clue was left behind, there is little for the officers to work on. <clears throat> Constables Charles C. Labrie, having received a complaint that a woman was loitering about the pine woods on Manchog Road, above the house of Charles W. Potter, and drinking ever and anon with male companions, drove to the place yesterday afternoon and found her. She was alone and reclining on the pine needles. 
At the East Douglas lockup, she said her name was Annie Scott and that she lives in Lawrence. She is a weaver and recently had a job for two weeks in Manchog, she said. She also said that she had been a widow for five months. She was heard to reproach herself several times with being too good-hearted. She is a slight build and wore a calico shirtwaist and skirt of cheap woolen. Beside her on the bench at the lockup was a small satchel of red leather. I have been drinking a good deal this week, she said. If it were not for drink, I should not be here now. She will have to stay in the lockup until tomorrow, when she will be taken to the district court at Blackstone. Edmund Burke, who was released from the House of Correction at Worcester Saturday morning of last week, spent the evening of the same day in the lockup here, having been arrested for drunkenness by Officer Labrie. Sunday morning, when he was released from his cell to go into the open room of the lockup for breakfast, he managed to obtain a knife that had been taken from him the night before, and before Keeper Herendine could interfere, had plunged it into the body near the heart. A physician was summoned and found the wound not dangerous, so after dressing it, Burke was taken to Blackstone, where he was sentenced to three months in jail. Francisco Bowen, undertaker, told Constable C.C. C. Labrie today that the practices of a gang of hoodlums that loafs around the green in front of the Axe Company's office Sunday nights. He asked Mr. Labrie to put a damper on their growing spirit of rowdiness. Most of them, Mr. Brown says, are from 12 to 15 years old. They pick out a couple amongst themselves and set themselves fighting just for the pleasure of the thing. They have sharp, bare-fisted encounters. When all are weary of the fighting, they gather along the streets and wrangle and talk profanely. Many persons going to and from the Methodist Church, across the street from the Green, have been no little annoyed by the talk and actions of the gang. This lockup expense for the tramp showed little difference from the one in 1880. Town Report of 1900. Lockup account. Paid for lock and keys, 50 cents. Whitewashing and cleaning, 3.25. A.C. Taylor, painting, $2. T. Wickstead, salary, $20. W.L. Church, six foot wood, $3. Root and Wickstead lockup supplies, 1732. Joseph Bowen, filing saws, 75 cents. Number of tramps for the year, 305. At the end of this 40-year span, from 1868 to 1908, the moral climate of Douglas remained about the same. The following police items occurred from 1901 to 1908. <clears throat> Officers from this place drove over to South Sutton Tuesday evening and arrested Mr. John Place and Mrs. Mary Adams. They were brought here in occupied quarters of the Stone Hotel overnight, and Wednesday were taken to Worcester and given a hearing in Central District Court. The evidence was sufficient to hold them for the grand jury, and the couple went to jail to await sitting of that body. Interested parties suspected that the couple were enjoying too intimate relations, and were on the watch to secure evidence that would prove their suspicions correct, and now believe they have sufficient grounds on which to convict them. The people of Douglas, who live on Upper Main Street, had their sleep disturbed at one o'clock yesterday morning by two men who were driving a team belonging to a Whitensville liveryman. The men were shouting and swearing and finally landed in the driveway at the home of Edwin Moore, Edwin P. Heath, deputy sheriff, who lives in the next house, was awakened by the shouts and twice ordered the men to leave. The visitors, who appeared to be badly fuddled, thought they were at a livery stable and were determined to put up their team. Mr. Heath set out to arrest one of them, but he escaped and ran up the street. His companion went in the opposite direction and was seen no more. The man who was running up the street was followed closely by the officer, and the chase was exciting. The night was dark, and there was not a ray from a street lamp in the vicinity. Near Herbert's studio, there is a large mulberry tree, and the runaway went into its trunk at full speed. The accident stunned himself, and he rolled off of the sidewalk into a field six feet below. Mr. Heath also fell off the embankment and injured a shoulder. By this time, Mr. Moore had arrived with a lantern, and the stranger was returned to the sidewalk and arrested for disturbing the peace. What appears to have been an attempt to rob the East Douglas Station of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad at 1.30 o'clock this morning was found out today. It was told tonight by night telegraph operator John J. Murphy. He says, At 1.30 this morning, while I was sitting in the office, a man came up on the outside and rapped on the window pane. When I asked him what he wanted, he asked for a drink of water. I told him my orders were to admit no one during the night, about whose identity I was not sure. He then said he wanted a bill changed. I told him we kept no money here. The man then said, you must have the money. You took selling excursion tickets the other day. I told him we kept no money overnight. After that, he said, I'm coming in anyway, and set about to carry about his purpose. He rattled the doors and windows and found them all tight. 
Then he went away for a time. A few minutes later, he came back with a woman. The woman began a conversation with me. In the meantime, the man went around to the rear and climbed up one of the toilet room windows, about twelve feet from the ground, and tried to open it. I heard him, drew my revolver, and went through the station into the toilet room. I told him to get down and fired one shot in his direction. A moment later, the woman fired three shots at the toilet, luckily none of which hit me. In the morning, I reported the incident to Deputy Sheriff E.P. Heath. Mr. Stockwell missed some of his tools Saturday night, and finding a window open, easily guessed how the thief or thieves had gotten in. While he left someone to guard the place, he went in search of an officer. He found that the deputy sheriff and all the constables had gone to Woonsocket, Rhode Island, to see the East Douglas baseball team slaughtered, and returned to his home. At 6.30, two men came to his shop, presumably to depart with a lot of Mr. Stockwell's tools. It so happened that Mr. Stockwell returned to his shop at about the same time and went in so as to bag the intruders. One of the men made good his escape. The other ran into a clump of alders. Mr. Stockwell quickly ran down Main Street and summoned a crowd of fifty made up largely of boys. These ran to the shop, and a search was begun for a man who was seen to run into the bushes. Every square inch of grass in the neighborhood was covered, and it was nearly half an hour before the man was found by John Stockwell, lying flat on his face in the tall grass covering him like a mantle. Mr. Stockwell pulled a revolver, and the man surrendered. Later, he was marched through Main Street by Mr. Stockwell, who, with revolver in one hand and the other firmly grasping the prisoner, and with fifty boys and men following, landed the man in the lockup at 7.30 o'clock. During the month of October 1902, the number of hens in town was considerably reduced by hen thieves. The reason for this great demand in just one month was not readily known. Accounts follow. On Thursday night, Mr. John Dudley had twenty hens stolen from his hen roost. The thieves cut their heads off and picked them before they left the premises. That's the coolest thing we heard of yet. Last week, Mr. George Manahan lost about thirty hens. Levi Darling and Asa Fitz have lost about twenty hens each the past week. Twenty hens were missing from the coop of Hammond C. Medcalf and twenty more from that of Jebediah B. Howard at roll call yesterday morning, as nothing could be found to show that the two bands of fowls had left their abodes of their own free will, it is supposed they were carried away by hen thieves. <clears throat> Mrs. Minnie Cloutier, a widow who lives at Gilboa Four Corners, sent a boy running to Constable Charles C. Labrie at 2.30 o'clock this morning to tell him that two hunters had walked by the house, had shot a batch of her hens on the road. One of the hens was hit and killed, and several others had their dignity ruffled by being made targets for airing rifle aim. She wanted Mr. Labrie to go on the trail of the hunters and to jail them if he could get his hands on them. Mr. Labrie had no sooner heard the message than he hurried to the livery stable of D. Barbour and hired a rig. Setting in pursuit along the Whitensville Road near Gilboa, he overtook two hunters riding a buggy with a driver. He ordered the hunters to get out and took them in his rig and drove them back to Miss Cloutier's, where he ought to settle the differences by inducing Miss Cloutier to take money for the value of her dead hen. No, she remonstrated, I don't want their money. I want them locked up, so that they may learn they have no right to go about shooting everybody's hens. Lock them. This part of the colloquy was in French, which Mr. Labrie speaks, but which the two hunters did not understand. Then they argued with her in English, and she retorted in French, and they didn't make much headway in their negotiations. Minnie's wrath eventually cooled, and she accepted one dollar for the dead hen. Total losses for the month, 130 sins stolen, and one shot. <clears throat> A party of boys made an attack on Jim Lee, a Chinese laundryman, and his son in their laundry in the basement of Mercier's Block on Main Street, below Thayer's Hall Block, during the demonstration uh, attending the inauguration of the 4th, early this morning. In the mix-up which followed, Lee's son was badly bruised about the head, and a fellow named Foster in the attacking party received a knife wound in the hand. The trouble was started about two o'clock, when a young man stood in front of the laundry and discharged the balls of a Roman candle into the laundry through the door. Lee went in after the invaders with a revolver, and his son was armed with a knife. C. C. Labrie, one of the special officers appointed for the 4th, soon arrived and tried to help Lee rout the invaders, but he too was attacked by the Chinamen and was forced to join the invading party in self-defense. Labrie ultimately succeeded in getting the weapons away from the Chinamen and then drove away the attacking party. 
The culprits, Frank Gazette, William S. Reynolds, and Joseph Foster of East Douglas, were arrested. The next day, they appeared before the District Court of Blackstone, where they were fined on the charge of assault and battery. Edwin P. Heath, deputy sheriff, told a telegram reporter after the trial this afternoon that others were implicit in the disturbance at the laundry and would be apprehended if evidence could be secured against them. He added that he was determined to eradicate the hoodlum element in East Douglas, which appears to Mr. Heath to be trying to run the town. <clears throat> Julia Moshkut, who lives in the three-story tenement house on Lower Main Street, known as the Old Whiting Tavern, has asked Constable Charles C. Labrie to help her find Joseph, Joseph Wunkowitz, who she says was her lover, and deserted her and stole $50 of her money beside. Julia is anxious that Wunkowitz be found. She gave Constable Labrie a photograph of Wunkowitz on a postcard and said that she wanted it put in the papers in order that all the officers might be on the lookout for him. The photograph is of a light-complexioned man of, 30, of 25 to 30 years, of medium height and build. He has fat cheeks, and above his forehead rises a crest of fair hair. His sack coat is tightly buttoned, and there is a cigarette in his left hand. Constable Labrie says that Wunkiewicz was living in East Douglas up to a few weeks ago. One place where he lived was the same tavern where Julia lives. He occupied a number of rooms in the basement, and while there was arrested on the charge of illegally selling liquor. He was found guilty in district court and paid a fine of $50. That was in November. Constable Labrie says that he will make every effort to locate Wunkowitz. The deputy sheriff and his constables satisfactorily performed their duties protecting persons and property of the community. This they accomplished under difficult circumstances, for they were on call to apprehend violators of the law and keep the main street clear of drunks and tramps. The citizens of Douglas were indebted to Deputy Sheriff Edwin P. Heath and his constables for their constant efforts to enforce the law and keep the peace.